Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love. And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon, and said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharan, and from there, from thence, <clears throat> when his father was dead, he removed him into his land wherein ye now dwell. And where do you live, you guys? Where do you live? What are you doing with your life? Where does your heart abide? Where are you residing right now? Where do you dwell? Do you dwell in safety, peace, love, holiness, righteousness, or do you dwell in chaos, strife, all kind of mess, confusion? Where do you dwell? Because see, one thing we forget is that when God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light, we're not to carry the darkness with us, y'all. We're not supposed to pack it up and put it in our suitcase and bring it with us just in case. No, there is no just in case with God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you getting? I'm, I'm talking allegorically right now. Leave the darkness behind you. Leave all that confusion, all that mess, all that wrath, strife, confusion, strife. Uh, all that conflict, leave it behind you. All that stress, leave it behind you. You're not to bring it with you into the presence of God. Leave that behind you. Now, let me liken it to something. And you're not going to like what the example, but I'm going to do it anyway. Imagine you're getting ready to get married. Now, that's coming to my mind hot off the press. Imagine you're getting ready to get married. You're getting in your wedding outfit, whether it's your tuxedo or your bridal gown. You're getting all together, but you're grabbing the old dirty underwear from yesterday or two weeks ago. You're grabbing dirty underwear. You're grabbing your dirty uh, undergarments, whatever they are, be it t-shirt, tank top, be it bra, panties, or drawers. You're putting on your dirty socks or your dirty stockings. And your bridal grounds got your bridal gowns got wrinkles in it. Your your tuxedo, cause you you tried it on the day before and then you sat and ate your dinner in it and got food all over your lapel. And you're wearing that to the wedding. Really? Really? You're going into a new beginning, a new chapter of your life. And you're going in there looking tacky, half tattered, and dirty. Really? Think of that. When you imagine moving into a new beginning with the Lord, you're walking with the Lord, you're moving into a new way of life, into a new bond, a new commitment, a new co level of communion. But you're bringing the old dirt with you? Why? Why do you need the crap when you've got the best? Why do you need the elements, the junky stuff, the trash? Huh? Why do you need the rubbish that was aimed for the trash can? Why do you need that when you have everything new, renewed, refreshed in God? New beginning, totally new beginning. Behold, all things are become new. What does the Bible say? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In our everyday language, it would say progressively are becoming new. You're being renewed day by day. Your life is being refreshed day by day. The cleansing process goes on and on and on. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every year, every decade, every century, if you live that long. So think about how the renewal, the healing, the refreshing goes on in your life.
on a constant basis by God. But you're still determined to bring the old dirty stuff with you. Why? You're still trying to hang with people who live a dirty life, who don't care about the Lord. They don't care about him. They're not interested in the things of God. You're trying to start anew, but you're still thinking back at the old stuff, longing for that old trashy, messy, what my old pastor used to call messy love, junky love. You're looking for that old lover. You're hanging on to that husband or wife that treats you like crap. You're hanging on to the old friends that are constantly tearing you down and trying to get you caught back up in their mischief because they don't like your new walk because now you're boring. They can't tell you those dirty jokes anymore. You don't need that old stuff. I'm not going to dwell on here, but I'm just making a point. When, when he left, when he obeyed God, Abraham heard from God. He obeyed. He left everything behind him without looking back. And the one he did do, which God did not tell him to do, was he brought Lot with him. And because he brought Lot with him, he ended up having a few problems that he didn't have to have. So what I'm trying to share with you is when God pulls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, oh, there's a big change to be expected. And there are decisions you must make. What are you going to leave behind? Will you leave some of it behind or will you leave all of it behind? See, your values, that's another thing. We have values at a human level that we need to turn our backs on completely because they don't belong in the things of God. They don't belong in this new walk with the Lord. Why? They'll tear you down. They will contaminate the very thing God is trying to blossom in your life. They will sabotage. I was looking for the word. That was a senior moment. They will sabotage what you are trying to achieve in the things of God. Believe it or not. Your own values. Why can't you see that man? Why can't you see that woman? You're not going to bed together anymore. So you think because you're not going anymore, it ain't going to happen no more? And no, that's a lie from the pit, baby. That's a lie from the pit. If you couldn't stay out of the bed then, guess what? Sooner or later, you're going to be back in the sack. Mm-hmm. There are times when you got to cut things and people out of your life. All right. Let's stop there and move on to the next point cuz I don't want to I don't want to be the dead horse. I made my point. Verse 5. And he gave him none inherit no, verse 6. And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall ye come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. You know what the number eight means? New beginning. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriots. And the patriots moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh. Now, this is Stephen's sermon. He's actually rehearsing all that took pass with their forefathers. But, you know, here's the sad part. When you look at this portion of the story and you look at how our own family members can turn on us, our own friends can turn on us. There are times you will find your friends will cut you loose, not because 
of your holiness, but because of the favor God has put in your life. They will see God doing for you what they're not getting out of life, and they will resent you because of the peace you have, the joy you have, because of the blessings God is showering you with. Here you are living off of one-tenth the income they live on, but they wonder why you're so blessed, and they kind of resent it, believe it or not. Yes. Why do you have so much of this and so much of that? You're piss poor. You ought to look poor. You shouldn't look as good as me. I'm the one with the money. You'd be shocked how your friends will turn on you based on their jealousy because of how the father showers you with his love. You'll find that as well. And it's okay to walk away from that because you don't need your feelings hurt but you must forgive and be there when they need you for prayer. Be there when they need you for counsel, but understand where they really stand with you. Know what you're dealing with. Just know what you're dealing with. Don't be blind. Don't look at everybody through rose colored glasses. Love everybody. Yes. All right. Now, moving from there, I want to skip down a little bit because one of the things that God is tired of is how the world treats his people, how some of his people treat his people. You will find there is a tremendous amount of abuse right there in the body of Christ. See, we think because we go to church, we're surrounded by God's people. Some of you who are on the outside looking in, you're not saved yet. And you're not saved yet because you, you have been disillusioned by the fact that you see mean people claiming to belong to Christ. You see vindictive, gossipy, backstabbing, spiteful, controlling, narcissistic, bullying, mm -hmm, intimidating critical people sitting there in the body of Christ claiming to be gods. They wouldn't know God if he walked up and stuck his finger up their nose. They wouldn't know who that was. But you're judging the church based on that. So here's another aside. Don't do that. Look at the ones who are genuine. Look at God. Focus on that. Forget the ones that are half-stepping. Forget the ones who are hypocrites. Forget all of them. Because guess what? When the last days come, God's going to forget about them too. So don't concentrate on that and judge the church based on their tacky ways. Don't do that. Because just like you don't like them, guess who else doesn't like the way they behave. Guess who else doesn't like their representation of him? Mm -hmm. So, and one day they may come to the end and hear, depart from me. I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. So don't get all, you know, don't get your panties tied up in a knot. Just remember, in every church, you're going to find the wheat and the tares because God allows them to grow up together for the sake of the wheat. You hear me? All right. Now, that's just an aside. Don't hold back from giving your heart to a good, loving God because you're dealing with some tacky-poo representatives of the church. Don't even go there. All right. Now, moving right along. <clears throat> I want to go down to There's a point where it talks about, for the sake of time, where it talks about how Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Do you know what his brothers really wanted to do? They wanted to drop him in a pit and leave him there to die. They wanted to kill him. See, that's what jealousy will get you. Jealousy will get you to the point where you have a murderous heart. And whether you commit the murder or not, God sees that murder. 
He sees it. And you're held accountable for what's in your heart. Be careful not to be jealous. Be careful. Be careful. Some of you have five, 10, 20 times what your spouse, what your friend, what your, your sibling, what your relative has. And you resent them for looking better than you. You resent them for having better taste than you. You resent them because they should look like they're so far beneath you. But in your mind, you see them as like, wow, and you hate them for it. You may not want to admit it, but you do. You'll help everybody else, but you won't help them because you don't want them looking that good. Not in comparison to you. Nobody's to outshine you after all. Look at where you are in your life. And you want everybody to know how high you stand. All right. Now, all right, so we have to be careful about jealousy. We have to be careful about what, how we treat each other based on what's in here. Because, see, God is trying to take you to another level. And just like there are things you need to leave behind you, you need to leave some of those attitudes behind you as well. The Bible says to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not going to cohabit with your flesh. As long as you present your body a living sacrifice, the Holy Spirit will continue the renewal, the cleansing, and the purging process. But as long as you expect the Holy Spirit to be happy to dwell with your mess, the mess of your flesh, no, that's not going to happen. You're going to have one or the other, flesh or God, God or flesh, your choice. Now, we're all imperfect. We all fall short of the glory of God, but we're constantly in God's presence for healing, for deliverance, for cleansing. We're there for that because we want to grow. We want to bear much fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, you do not want God to look at you as lukewarm and spew you out of his mouth because you're detestable. You don't want that. You want to always be caught at least trying. So whatever you do, understand, I'm trying to keep this as nice as possible. I really am because the scriptures I got could actually sound really, really mean and cold. So what I want to share with you is be very careful as you walk with the Lord not to allow your doors to be left unlocked, not to allow your windows to be unlatched. Why? Because you are the temple of God. And the only way the demons get in and they have a right to enter your temple is if you leave everything unlocked. How do you leave things unlocked? By that nastiness that you harbor in your heart toward your brother, your sister, your cousin, your whoever. How do you let the devil in and the demons to come in and wreak havoc in your life? Because you're longing for the things that are behind you. The old sins that you used to love, you still kind of want them. And you're torn. You're torn between that and the unknown that God has ahead of you. Ask God to give you mercy while you're in that state, because that is a dangerous place to be. It's being teeter-tottered, back and forth, side to side. You don't know if you want this. You don't know if you want that. You're looking behind you because you remember, oh, how good that felt. But then you're looking ahead of you because you know there are blessings that only God can give you, but God isn't enough for you right now because you don't really know him and you're kind of in a quandary. So you don't know if he's worth hanging in there for till you realize the blessings. And you're longing for what's behind you because you know how good it felt, but you also know how bad it felt. Crazy, huh? See, some of you hang on to old stuff that you should have left behind you. 
Why? Because that's all you know. You don't know what the future holds. You've never lived on your own, so you're afraid. You've never done that. You've never opened up your own business. You never tried this new new level before. So you're afraid of failure. Some of you are afraid of love. You know, when you get so stuck in yourself, you almost... You end up being full of yourself. And when you're full of yourself, you have no room for God. You have no room for what God has for you because you're so full of me, myself, and I. What about me? 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 And you go through your life that way. You end up becoming self-centered, self-focused, sell fish hmm. and you don't realize you're squeezing everybody else out because you are the center of your universe and you end up becoming your own idol taking the place of God because you value how you feel more than what God wants you to believe And that's why some of you go into adulterous relationships, fornication, homosexuality, pedophilia, gambling, go, uh, what's that word, uh, gorging, just eating, 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 gluttony. You go into, you, you shop till you drop. You shop yourself into debt. You shop yourself into a bottomless pit because you're emotionally shopping. Everything you do is based on feeding me, feeding me, feeding me. Feed, I'm upset, I gotta shop. I'm upset, I gotta eat. I'm upset, I gotta slap you down. I'm upset, I need sex. I'm upset, come on now. It ain't about you. But unfortunately, that's where you're focused. So you live what they call a dysfunctional life. Because you're limping through life like a spastic. Part of you wants to serve God. Part of you wants to serve the longings of your flesh, baby. Part of you wants to take out all your anger and beat people up. Part of you wants to do everything that you know you should not do. So you're torn over here. You're pulled over here. You're yanked back forwards and yet forward. You're trying to push yourself forward and you don't, you're in a quandary. You don't know what to do. Why? Your mind's not made up. That's what it all boils down to. Your mind is not made up. You know it, and God knows it. See, when you live a spastic life, think about having an arm that wants to reach forward, but your mind wants it to go down on the table. Think about this now. And instead of going down on the table, it pops back forward because it's spastic. It has these, these reflexes that you can't control. Why can't you control them? Because your mind is not strong enough to control what's going on here. There's something that's blocking the signal between your brain and your arm. That's why you have spasms like that. People live spastic lives. People live crippled lives. People live sabotage lives. They start to make progress and something happens. You get upset and you quit. You get upset and you blow up. You get upset and you lose relationships. Why? You're sabotaging every good thing that happens in your life. Some of it is because you're afraid 
of success. Some of it is because you're afraid of failure. Some of it is because you're afraid. So you live your life under a cloud of fear. See, there are a lot of reasons why a lot of us get caught up in the sins of the flesh, in the sins of the heart, and not letting go of the things in the past. Because it's those things that will hold you back. If you're trying to climb a mountain, you're trying to move up to the highest level to get the best view, you can't carry all your clothes, your luggage, your knapsack, everything on your back. You'll never get up there. You're barely going to be able to get you up the hill. You can't carry that old stuff, y'all. You got to let it go sometimes. All right. I just ask you to ask God to sever your tie. Sever the soul ties. Some of you are committing fornication right now. You can't stop because you started. Uh-huh. I've done it. And I had to break up with the man of my life. Yes, I'm not talking to somebody who's so pure as the driven snow that I've never touched the unclean thing. No. I have committed sexual sin. And I ain't going to call it a mistake. Y'all quit calling your sins a mistake. It may be poor judgment call, but it sure ain't no mistake. Because when you part them legs or you drop them pants, baby, you know well what you're doing. So don't call it no mistake. Acknowledge it for what it is. But when I got to that point where I had to choose, my man... And my man was Milton. Or the Lord. I cut Milton loose like he was a gangrenous leg. Like he was a, a deadly infection. I cut him loose. And guess what he said being a man of God that he was. Because we both got weak. He said, you know what? You're right. We both need to focus on the Lord. All right. So, never shall the twain meet, right? But what God did was because he sacrificed me. I sacrificed him. We both, we didn't even talk on the phone, y'all. My request was, Lord, see, God will bless you as long as he knows you put him first. My request to the Lord was I would get knee deep into the things of God, prison ministry, preaching, convalescent home, park ministry, whatever he wanted me to do, inner healing for myself, whatever. It would always be about the Lord. And I asked the Lord, keep Milton so far out of my life, I would never see him again in life. Because I don't want any man standing in the place of God. There is no climax in the world worth losing your soul for. There's no climax in the world worth losing that connection with God for. It's not worth it, y'all. And some of y'all never did connect with God. You believe in him, but you never truly connected with him because you allowed sin in your life for so long. You don't even know what it's like to be tightly connected with God because you never totally removed the old or the sin. So, Saying all that to say, I told the Lord, I don't ever want to run into him at a store. I don't want him calling me for somebody's phone number. And you know what? The only thing I told the Lord, because I love Milton, was if you ordain for us to get married, the only way, the only sign I want, is that he would call me with a marriage proposal. If there's no marriage proposal, that phone goes right back down on the cradle. And he didn't know it. He didn't know anything about that. I put that before the Lord. And I bound the enemy that he would not try to send any nonsense to get me tied back in to more nonsense. 
11 months later. Oh, wait, wait, let me share this. When you give something up for the Lord, you know what? The Lord makes it easy when he knows your mind's made up. My mind was made up, baby. As much as I love Milton, I cut him out of my life completely. And God made it easy. I didn't even miss his company. I didn't stop loving him, but I didn't miss him at all. God did that for me. And I stayed knee deep in the things of God. Totally out of touch with him. No connection whatsoever. And he rang my phone one day with a marriage proposal. And the rest is history. We had a wonderful relationship in our marriage. A wonderful connection. God was all in the center of it. Why? Because we both knew that God had to come first. Not our fleshly desires. All right. See, I ain't going to be phony with you. I ain't going to walk around getting on your case like I never did wrong. Oh, no, honey, my stuff stinks too. But for the grace of God, but for the power of the Holy Spirit, but for the intervention of God's mercy and power in my life. So what I'm trying to tell you is ask God to give you a maid mind so that you will not allow the compromise to go on and go on and go on. Yeah, we sidestep. Yeah, we lose our way. Yeah, we stray. We get distracted and we end up on detours. Get back on track, baby. Don't live there. Get back on track. If you got to cut everything out your life to get your relationship with God right, do what you got to do, but don't lose God for no flesh. It ain't worth it. I'm going to leave you with that. God bless you. Be encouraged. Hang in there. Don't give up the ghost on your relationship with God. He's the best thing coming and going, baby. He's all you got. Amen.